So as I was saying, uh, I've decided basically to present both in terms of a general perspective of addiction, where we are and what are the priorities for the Institute in terms of gathering knowledge and science uh, to also uh, take this moment that has been so very hard for all of us in, across the world uh, brought by the pandemic and that has made many people vulnerable to drug taking as a means to uh, cope with the stress and uncertainty and the loss of loved ones. Um, to use that moment to learn, um, actually, because sometimes these tragic events are the ones that make evident some of the, where we have gaps, but also generate uh, opportunities for innovation in terms of solving problems. We've known now for more than three decades that all of the drugs that produce addiction do so by activating the dopaminergic system that stimulates what has now been referred to as a dopamine reward system. Uh, the, the drugs activate the dopamine system differently, either by directly activating, stimulating, make the dopamine cells fire like nicotine, or by inhibiting cells that inhibit the dopamine cells. So inhibition of inhibition creates disinhibition and stimulates dopamine, or by preventing recycling of dopamine back into the terminal allowing it to stay much longer in the synapse. All of these mechanisms actually result in the activation of uh, the dopaminergic receptors that then through various mechanisms and circuits lead to the enhanced motivation that occurs when a person is addicted, but also degrade the ability for self-regulation and control. And through various studies that employ both humans and animals, uh, it has been possible to actually delineate the circuits that are engaged in the process of addiction. It is also clear that addiction is a cyclical in its presentation that goes from the intoxication phase that actually leads to withdrawal and then enables um, sort of a, a recovery of the craving and the desire for more and more drug that results in the compulsive behaviors that lead to drug taking. And this entails different uh, neuro circuits that interact with one another and that, pray, that play different roles depending on the cycles at which an individual finds themselves. With this knowledge, it's now possible, of course, to target specifically these circuits that are deranged by drug taking and in that way uh, improve um, the, the, per, the outcomes in individuals that are addicted. We've also come to recognize that addiction is not just the effect of drugs affecting the brain. And we know that because not everybody that gets exposed repeatedly to drugs actually have the changes uh, that result in addiction, the loss of control, the intense drive to take uh, the drug despite its adverse consequence. It's only a certain percentage of individuals that go on to develop addiction. We know that genetics are important that uh, we know this because family histories of individuals that uh, were several members have a history of addiction are at much greater risk of becoming addicted themselves. And this is not just by the fact of serving as an example, observing the others taking drugs, because this has been seen also in children that has been reared by parents who were not their biological parents, but that when they had uh, parents that were, for example, alcoholics, they were at higher risk even though they did not grow up with them. We also know that the stage at which an individual gets exposed to drugs also influences the likelihood of becoming addicted. The younger an individual gets exposed to drugs, the greater the risk of addiction. And importantly and crucially, I think we've always recognized how indispensable environments are, either in basically increasing the risk or in providing resilience. So an individual, for example, that has the genetic vulnerability to addiction, if they have an environment that provides a lot of resilience where there's no access to drugs, may never develop addiction. Whereas individuals with lower levels of genetic vulnerability in environments that are very, very stressful with social deprivation, with uh, social abuse, with, with, with lack of opportunity, and with access to drugs, is at much higher risk of becoming addicted. And what we now have with respect to science, which is an area that is really extraordinary, we now have the tools to understand what is it that genes are doing to our brain uh, that makes us vulnerable to addiction. 
or what is it that genes are doing to our brains that leads us to react differently to the environment in such a way that that is the process that leads to addiction? And why is it that actually developmental stages are so important? Why is it that an adolescent is exposed to drugs or adverse environments? It's much more likely to have long lasting negative effects from them than an adult. And with that, those technologies, researchers are starting to actually to unveil areas that are extraordinarily interesting on the one hand, but on the other one, provide those targets for um, interventions that we can now start to think for the first time that can be personalized. That is to say, targeted to the unique characteristics of the individual. Why do I, what do I need by these scientific advances? Well, look, for example, at this study that was published now uh, eight years ago. It is a study that looks at the, the changes in the brain morphology of the brain from age 5, 8, 11, 14, and 17. And you can see in red the areas where basically the morphology, the development of those areas, are actually heritable, which indicates that they have a long comp genetic component. And because these studies of heritability, what they are the way that they are done is you compare the similarities between identical twins and the similarities between discordant twins and the similarities between siblings. Uh, because identical twins share gene their genetics fully. Um, they're, they're, if, they, they, if they basically you have a genetic um, a factor contributing to a given characteristic, there will be higher similarity between them than that that you observe on discordant twins that only share half of that genetic similarity, whereas both of them share the environment. And one can use this, this uh, design to differentiate between the influence, what is done here in this row here, of genes versus the influence of environment. And, and you see something fascinating that is um, in the environment, the influence of the environment are extraordinarily strong during their first early years of development, years five and eight, and even 11 years of age. Later on, they are less influential in the brain morphology as assessed by, by just brain volumes. On the other hand, you can see that the genetics are influencing the development of the brain much more homogeneously throughout all of these years until adolescence, late adolescence. Though again, also we see a stronger influence during the childhood years. But this, this particular finding, what it highlights is why it becomes so very crucial to do prevention interventions and to create support for children as they develop into adolescence. Because these are the periods that are likely to have the most impact in an individual's life. And certainly as it relates in this case to brain morphology, which ultimately determines and serves as a structure for brain function. And it's through brain function that each one of all becomes an individual. Also, researchers have been connoting that the different areas of the brain develop at different um, stages. There are areas of the brain that develop very rapidly. For example, the areas of the brain that are involved with sensations are basically reach um, full development much faster than brain areas that are important. For example, what we call association cortices that are important for complex processes like thinking. And similarly, limbic areas of the brain that are, are relevant for uh, are processing emotions develop much faster than these cognitive areas that are necessary for self-regulation or executive function. And this is what we see here. The limbic regions develop much faster, this is age, than the prefrontal regions that basically do, that do not reach full maturity until you are in your mid-20s. And this disparate development of areas of the brain, in this case, the one that is involved with emotions and the one that is involved with executive function and self-regulation, explain why our children and adolescents are much more impulsive and have more intense emotions than adults do, and why it's much harder for them to regulate them, because the areas of, of the brain that are necessary to inhibit um, very strong reactions are not fully developed. Based on that, we can understand then why, uh, what practically we have seen 
that prevention interventions during childhood have a big impact in improving outcome in children. And the way that the prevention research arena has uh, evolved is that it has actually identified through independent studies that, that, that the way that prevention should work is basically by decreasing the risk and by enhance, enhancing protecting factors. The risks that have been identified are actually can be classified with risks that relate to the individuals, characteristics of their, their, their particular personality, their family, their peers they are surrounding themselves with, the school in which they learn, and the community in which they live. At the individual level, for example, we know that early aggressive behavior or poor social skills increases the risk of drug taking and subsequently addicted. addiction. Thus, prevention interventions aim to reduce these behaviors. As it relates to family, it is clear that it's one of the strongest components that, that can have an impact in a child's life. And the lack of parental supervision, neglect, actually leads to increased risk for drug taking. And thus, what one actually aims from prevention intervention is to improve the competences of those families, those parents, that they can then lead them to the, the, the support. Similarly, uh, substance use in the family, drug availability, and living in poverty, oral factors that are also, because they provide less access and opportunities, the low, much worse school education, uh, high levels of violence, of deprivation in a community, increase the risk of uh, drug taking. And those the protective environments are aimed to actually improve the self-regulation, improve the ability of the child to monitor and support uh, it show, uh, basically teach them skills about how to actually refuse uh, risky behaviors, improve them and teach them how to form meaningful social relationships, improve the competence of the pa uh, parents. In the school, actually prevention uh, interventions are also one of the most effective. And the development of drug use policies that will actually protect children and adolescents from drug taking. And certainly the improvement of neighborhoods, will, which actually, on the one hand, allow for uh, children and adolescents to develop their social skills and actually have alternative behaviors. So what we are right now aiming to do at this stage of where we are, where we know what are the prevention interventions that work at the level of universal prevention, or in some instances, targeted prevention for, for children at higher risk. And I fail to comment that one of the the factors that increases the vulnerability for children uh, in an adolescence is uh, underlying psychiatric diseases, emerging psychiatric diseases are actually um, the first, uh, one of, I, I would say one of the factors that um, connotes a higher risk because if anything, children or adolescents will, will start to take drugs as a means to escape the discomfort brought about, about by the incipient mental illness. So in order to, to understand this better and to try to actually assess the consequences of these factors of incipient mental illness, of exposure to violence or deprivation on the human brain, we started two very large uh, cohort studies. One of them, the first one that we started is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study that goes by ABCD which is a longitudinal study of about 12,000 children from ages nine and 10 that are being followed up prospectively through adulthood into, until they enter early adulthood. And the idea is to assess the factors that influence their brain development trajectories at the individual level and their functional outcomes as assessed by their behavior, their performance at school, their use of social media, their uh, friendship networks. And this study uh, was started in 2015 with recruitment in 2016. And so in now in its sixth year, the study has an open uh, access design so that the data is deposited on a yearly basis on a platform that can be used by investigators all over the world to inquire about uh, the scientific questions they may be interested in asking. In this particular study, we basically took enormous care to ensure that there was in-depth characterization of the social environment that these adolescents were living on. And this is because we wanted to understand why, how is it that the social determinants of health 
which are also social determinants for the risk of substance use disorders or addiction, influence the brain so we can understand what are those trajectories. And there's an enormous amount of, of uh, knowledge that has already been gained by these uh, studies. So inspired by the success of the ABCD study, last year in September, we launched an equivalent study for that is initiated in infancy. And this study goes by the name of Healthy Brain and Child Development Study, or HPCD study. And it aims to recruit 7,500 infants to understand the normative neurodevelopment from early birth, from early birth to nine to 10 years and to assess impact of in utero exposures to drugs and harmful environments. So this particular study is oversampling children, it's aiming to oversample children whose mothers were exposed uh, to drugs during pregnancy. And it will enable us to look into greater detail in a much larger sample and controlling for factors like genetics or family history of diseases which have not been controlled or by been limited by sample sizes of other studies that have already, for example, started, started to reveal how the um, social deprivation, as is the case for children that had, were born in this case in a Romanian orphanage, and, and monitoring how that affects the connectivity of their, the brains of these children. And this is a result from one of such studies that indicates that, that, the, um, that, the, that the, um, the fascicle that uh, connects the frontal cortex with the limbic brain region is actually um, has delayed development in children that were born in an orphanage. And that uh, the longer they've been in the orphanage, the slow, basically, the more the delayed of the formation of this tract. Now, we, with, this, with this new large study, we'll be able to determine the extent to which this number one is replicated, the extent to which there is uh, diversity among children, to the, the response to adverse environment, the importance of how, how, to what extent uh, one could res restitute uh, these uh, changes in connectivity of the brain by providing a resilient environment, what is the resilience ultimately, and the ability of the children's brain to recover if, in, if they actually are then placed in a proper environment. This is an example of a study that was done on the ABCD, others have been published, but in this particular study we were interested in understanding how um, the family income actually affected the development of the human brain. So this was done on the, the 10,000 10, for which we have complete data of the children uh, the, when they were nine to 10 years old. And we, what we did was basically assess the relationship between the income of the families and either the volume of the brain or the cortical thickness. And we also said that the influence of the income of the family in cognitive abilities. So these are the results for the family income here. The higher the family income, the lower the family income. And these are composite test scores for different type of uh, uh, cognitive tests, whether it is the uh, flexibility or the, the crystal composite, which is ultimately the uh, intelligence that's associated with language and words versus the fluid uh, composite, which is more the abstract thinking and the coming up with solutions. And you can see that, uh, and this is just the composite that it basically averages both of them. But you can see that the higher the income of the families that the children are born into, the higher the cognitive function of these children. And when you look also at the values for the uh, volume, you see overall that the, um, all the cortical volumes are significantly higher in the children that come from family income. Here you have on the cortical thickness. Cortical thickness, this, this slope is not so, actually is much more horizontal than this one, but it's still significant, but it's much milder. The effect on cortical thickness is not as dramatic as what observes for cortical volume. But the bottom line is that this factor, income inequality, was the factor among all of the other ones that were evaluated that has the largest effect by far in the degree to which there was variability in cognitive abilities in these adolescents. 
and in which there was also differences in their in their brain volume. And this was interesting because what what it did come about that this was the factor that seems to be accounting for what had been reported in the past at differences in cognitive performance between race and ethnic groups. And it so happens that a much greater proportion of children of underrepresented groups, which in the United States are Hispanics and Black Americans, actually come from families whose incomes are much lower. And what this highlights, though, is that therefore, in front of us, is a factor that is tractable. That is to say that we can intervene and prevent these differences. And in fact, studies had actually in a much smaller cohort had indicated that prevention interventions, that what they did was provide support to families uh, from uh, poor neighborhoods. And this was done in a black neighborhood uh, where given the resources to actually take care of their children, to be present with them and guiding them on how to parent them. You can see that uh, whereas in the no interventions, the years in poverty at age 11 or 18 are associated with smaller volumes, both in the amygdala and the hippocampus. The intervention that provide added resources to those families of low income significantly prevented this degradation. So the data is already out there, and this is a smaller study, of course, but indicates that these changes that we are observed can be reversed, provided that those families are given the, the ability to actually um, parent properly these children because they have the resources. Uh, and, and, and what is notable in, in this particular study is that the volumes that are highlighted here are the amygdala and the hippocampus. And now these are two of the limbic areas that have been associated with mood reactivity and link with higher risk, not just for substance use and addiction, but also for other psychiatric diseases. Um, with respect to treatment, uh, there's been also a lot of advances in the area of treatment. Um, the most advances have been done actually in the area of opioid addiction, alcohol addiction, and tobacco addiction, nicotine addiction. And in these three diseases of addiction, substance use disorders, we have medications that are very effective. I should say the, I, the medications are very effective for opioid use disorder. And they are effective both for nicotine addiction and for alcohol use disorder, but the effects are much larger for when it comes to opioid use disorder. In opioid use disorder, we had three medications that are widely used, methadone, naltrexone, buprenorphine. Widely used is relative, but uh, that they are actually uh, increasingly being used. In alcohol use disorder in the United States, we have uh, FDA approval of three medications, bisulfiram, naltrexone, and acamprosate. And in the, uh, for nicotine addiction in the United States, we have the FDA approved nicotine replacement therapies, bupropion and varenicline with the highest effect sizes observed with varenicline, but also um, even higher, the combination of varenicline with nicotine replacement therapies. In the area of research and science also, the aspect of innovation is emerging as an opportunity to give us different strategies, for example, to address issues of addiction in different ways from what we've done in the past. For example, there's been an enormous amount of interest of developing immunotherapies. Initially, most of the interest were on by own vaccines against nicotine, cocaine, or fentanyl. But now there is increasing much more interest in immunotherapies, passive administration of antibodies against methamphetamine or fentanyl. The way that these, these uh, immunotherapies work, whether it's through a vaccine or a passive administration of antibodies, is normally that drugs circulate in the brain and passes unimpeded into, in, in, in the blood, passes unimpeded through the blood vessels into the brain. If you have antibodies, whether you produce them through a vaccine or you gave them passively through in basically administration of the uh, antibodies, the antibodies will actually bind to the drug and that will interfere their passage from the blood vessels into the brain, interfering with their actions. And one of the aims that's actually very interesting in right now is a strategy like this one, of course, can be utilized to treat toxicity from excess consumption of drugs. And this can be for methamphetamine, cocaine, 
or even fentanyl. But because these um, monoclonal antibodies, now the new technologies allow them, decreases their degradation, uh, it is possible that these uh, monoclonal antibodies may be used for therapy, provided that sufficient titers can last for long periods of time, which appears to be the case in many instances for these monoclonal antibodies. And when I speak about long lasting effects, one can say three or four weeks uh, proper titers. Another area that is very, very exciting in research, as I was describing earlier, we've come to realize that circuits that are embe uh, embedded within the drive the intoxication phase, that drive the withdrawal phase, and that drive the craving phase. And now with neuromodulation technologies that can be used non-invasively, or in some instances in invasively by the deep brain stimulation, like we do for Parkinson's disease, but um, also through non-invasive non procedures like transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation, or through ultrasound stimulation, or even to peripheral nerve stimulation like auricular stimulation that aims to actually activate the vagus. Through these stimulations, one can either activate areas of the brain that, for example, like the prefrontal cortex, become inhibited, uh, leading to the impulsive behaviors and the compulsive actions, or activate er or, or inhibit areas that were basically are driving the enhanced uh, saliency of drug rewards and the enhanced motivation, for example, as may be the case of the insula, the enhanced interoceptive activity that leads to the increased desire. So these technologies, we can modulate and strengthen areas that have been weakened by drugs while inhibiting areas that have been enhanced or sensitized in the addiction process. Also, as we move forward in the development of new therapeutics, whether it is medications, immunotherapies, um, neuromodulatory technologies, or behavioral interventions, what has become clear is that we need to expand the outcomes that we're going after. In the past, the FDA, and it still is the case, but they are actually willing to negotiate alternative outcomes. The FDA only accepted as outcome abstinence. Now, abstinence is not, it's a, actually quite a difficult goal to reach, and only a few percentage of individuals are able to achieve abstinence. Even, eventually, with repeated treatment, many of them may achieve that abstinence, but that they may take years. And the problem is that in the process, if we can identify treatments that improve their outcome, we may prevent them from basically consuming large amounts of drugs and, and that therefore decrease the risk of overdosing or dying, or also decrease the risk of other medical adverse effects or social negative consequences. So now we are aiming to actually conducting clinical trials to assess which medications that even if they do not produce complete abstinence may be of benefit to the person that is taking them. For example, alternative outcomes could be reduced use, controlled use, decreased craving, improved cognitive function, improved sleep, improved uh, decreased depression, or others that actually are driving the drug taking and the harmful behaviors. As I mentioned, as of now, we have not yet got an approval from FDA based on these indications, but there are ongoing clinical trials. For example, there is a trial ongoing currently um, to evaluate uh, suborexan, which is a medication used for insomnia in individuals with an opioid use disorder who have severe disruption of their sleep pattern and in whom basically one of the drivers for taking drugs is in order to be able to, take, to sleep. And that is a similar situation in the case of cannabis. That's a similar situation that we recognize now, now for many years for alcohol use disorder. Now to the second point that I had mentioned that I wanted to basically lead us all into focusing. What is it that we have learned from the COVID pandemic that can be useful in the way that we treat, uh, and that can alert us of things that we need to address in our society. One of them here is, you all know that over the past two decades, the United States have been uh, living the worst of opioid overdose crisis it has ever had. 
And this started at the beginning of the 2000s with the overprescription of opioid medications that around 2010 led to the increase in use of heroin. Uh, then in 2014, both the use of opioid prescriptions, overdoses from opioid prescriptions and heroin stabilized, but we started to see a significant rise in overdose deaths from fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, much more potent than, than heroin. It's estimated to have 50-fold higher intrinsic efficacy than heroin. It's also a much faster drug, and therefore it produces on the, on the one hand has higher rewarding effects, but also it has a higher risk of um, respiratory depression. And so the risk of overdose death is much higher with fentanyl than with, with heroin or other prescription opioids. The heroin that is responsible starting in 2015 for the very steep rise in overdoses is illicitly manufactured. Well, what has happened during the um, COVID pandemic? This is January 2019 to March 2020, just before the declaration of emergency in the United States. And you can see that all of the drug overdoses were increasing already, and they have been increasing. The only year we were able to decrease the number of overdoses was 2018. And that was very shortly, because 2019, you can start to see the, to see the rises here. This is all drug overdoses, opioid involved, synthetic opioids. And this is what I say, it's what's driving them. But we've also seen a significant uh, increase in overdose deaths from stimulants, whether it is methamphetamine or cocaine. And in the dark purple is the period of the pandemic from March 20 to March 21. And you can see that overall with a very, very high rate already of overdose death, very high numbers, look at these numbers here. You already see the significant actually increase. Now this is per month. And you, you get an idea of the number of deaths that we are observing in the United States. And look at when it comes to synthetic opioids. These are all of the opioids involved, synthetic opioids. And where a stimulant drug, you can say it's, it's lower for methamphetamine or cocaine. If you add them up, you can see that it's almost basically a little bit more than two thirds what we're seeing from fentanyl. So this is the data, the latest data, just in quantity in numbers in that end from the 12 months that end in 2021, in November, 2021 when we had 106, uh, more than 106,000 deaths, close to 107. Uh, the data for December actually was just released and it was close to 108,000. And overall during this year of the, 20, the second year of the pandemic, we saw uh, what appears to be a 15% in overdose mortality. The first year of the pandemic, 2020, saw a 30% increase in overdose mortality. The second year, so a 15% over that 30%. So we've seen almost like a 50% mortality over the two years in overdose deaths over the two years of the pandemic. It's not heroin, heroin has gone down. Now is it prescription opioids that, which initiated the whole opioid crisis? It is uh, synthetic opioids, it is cocaine, it is methamphetamine. And what we know is that the deaths from these drugs more than half of them, in the case of cocaine is 75%, in the case of methamphetamine is 60%. All, more than half of those deaths are associated with combination with fentanyl. And this is actually where the reality stands right now. The illicit drug market in the United States during the COVID pandemic accelerated the distribution of fentanyl. And while initially it was used to contaminate heroin, it currently is used to contaminate cocaine, methamphetamine, and more recently, illicitly manufactured prescription drugs. And that has expanded the number of people that are now vulnerable for overdoses. And I bring this in a global um, meeting because even though the synthetic opioid problem is actually predominantly affecting North America, it's not just the United States, it's also Canada. The profits that drug dealers can make from this drug is gigantic. And those the incentive to find new markets is likely to start to be observed in other countries. And unfortunately, we're already seeing an increases in fentanyl overdoses in Mexico. And there are also increases in some of the uh, synthetic opioid overdoses in certain parts of Europe. And this is an area that we need to be proactive to prevent it from actually replicating what is happening in the United States. 
and to recognize that synthetic drugs are likely to be one of the biggest challenges that we see in the substance use field into the future. And again, because of the easiness of production, you need to do not need to cultivate the, and the enormous uh, gain margins that the drug dealers have from the selling of these drugs. What is it that drove the COVID pandemic really high numbers? All of the stressors that we discussed, including the removal of social support systems that actually were necessary for people to actually have treatment or have social support. And this is a methadone clinic. In, I think it's sort of at the beginning of 2020. And these are, were the conditions of methadone clinics. It increased the number of homeless people in throughout the world, certainly in the United States. And the highest mortality that actually we have seen in overdoses are among the homeless people. And also people with substance use disorders very frequently end up in prisons and jails. And that actually is one of the worst social stressors. And in the circumstances of the COVID pandemic, resulted in accelerated and higher increase of infection. Um, during situations of stress, and particularly as serious as the COVID pandemic, stigma can be exacerbated because the tolerance of people is reduced. And so stress and stigma actually in, made it much harder for individuals who were suffering from substance use disorder or taking drugs to seek the help that they need. So they were among the most vulnerable and negatively affected by the COVID pandemic. But, we, but also there was a massive expansion of the fentanyl uh, during, the, there has been a massive expansion of fentanyl, as I was saying, they, the distribution of fentanyl accelerated during the, the COVID pandemic years. This is data for drug seizures, seizures from uh, fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 20. This is the year, the first year of the pandemic for which we have data. And you can see how the fentanyl has been going up and look at this huge jump that it does during the pandemic. And similarly, look at methamphetamine, look at this huge jump that it does during the, the pandemic. And unfortunately now, methamphetamine, which by itself is quite a toxic drug, now the, the fact that the basically which the data is telling us 60% of the people that are dying are with combination with fentanyl, indicates too that now that it's being in many instances mixed with fentanyl, its lethality is much worse. So what to do about it? And again, we always emphasize the, the importance of treatment and is the strongest defense that we have against opioid use disorder. It's the strongest that we, um, uh, tool that we have for preventing overdoses. All of these medications, methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, all of them work and they prevent overdoses, they prevent relapse, and in, they improve recovery. Naloxone also is a very effective medication that if given in time at the adequate dose, reverses an overdose, and it reverses an overdose of fentanyl. Fentanyl may require higher doses and repeated administration, but if done rapidly and promptly, it saves the life of the person. So uh, the strategy of the administration and what the research has shown is that the widespread distribution of these treatments significantly improves and prevents people from dying. One of the challenges that we have is that uh, even though these medications are actually, the evidence is quite strong, they are not given to all of them, and I'll show you the numbers in a, in a, in a moment. But also, even when people take them, the risk of discontinuation of treatment at six months is between 40 and 50%. And, and this, this data here, which is a very recent study published in women that were pregnant to determine the protection from non-fatal overdoses by the use of buprenorphine. And it shows that uh, in individuals, even 10 weeks of when they were on medication for opioid use disorder, basically re reduce their overdose uh, risk, non-fatal overdose risk by 57%. But if they were on 40 weeks, it reduced their overdose risk almost completely, 97%. Highlighting that is not just administering the medications, but also retaining the patients in treatment. And these are the numbers uh, in, from the United States, um, basically showing of the 1.6 million people age 12 or older with a past year opioid use disorder, only 18% of them receive a medication for, their opioid, for opioid use disorder in the past year. 
And this, you can see, actually leaves a very large population that could benefit, benefit from the administration of these medications. And the question is, what is it that we can do to basically expand access to um, the delivery of these medications so that we can reach a wider number of people that could benefit? And the other one, as I mentioned, is what is it that we can do to improve retention? For this, we have prioritized, because of the current situation, implementation research and basically working, just taking advantage of three very large uh, structures that we've generated to do research. One of them is the clinical trials network that basically across 17 nodes and academic centers throughout the United States enables us to uh, recruit patients rapidly and to determine the effectiveness of therapeutic interventions that take advantage of the healthcare system, whether it is through emergency departments, primary care physicians, infectious disease doctors, or nurses uh, interacting with physicians, or physicians interacting with pharmacies, taking a, advantage of the healthcare system to implement interventions for the treatment of substance use disorders. We've also generated a justice community uh, opioid innovation network that's titled JCoin to, uh, to also create and establish partnership across the United States between jails and um, people that work in jails and the healthcare system and academic centers to develop models of care that can improve the outcome of individuals that end up in jails and that link them with healthcare system and support systems when they are released into the community and also to test therapeutic interventions within the jails that can be initiated while the individuals are still in the jail itself. And then finally, we launched a very large study across four states that had the highest rates of opioid overdoses in the United States, uh, where we actually recruited 67 communities to do um, basically to evaluate a battery of evidence-based interventions for prevention and treatment on opioid use disorder and overdoses that bring together healthcare, justice, communities, uh, and that bring together the different organizations, including the state agencies, to actually integrate efforts and document that how a harmonized intervention with the support systems that are necessary and guided by data in order to tailor and modify accordingly can significantly reduce overdoses. These are some of the findings that have already emerged. For example, through the CTN, uh, through the studies on the emergency department, it has been shown that the administration of buprenorphine in the emergency department significantly improved outcomes for patients with opioid use disorder. In a subsequent study, this was published last year, they showed that initiation of large doses of buprenorphine in the emergency department, more than 12 milligrams actually, what did not result in negative event, there were not, not more withdrawal symptoms than when they initiated with a lower dose. And this actually is contrary to the beliefs of many clinicians who initiate people very, very low doses of buprenorphine because of fear of withdrawal. This study shows that under these conditions, it actually was quite safe. And they are now um, basically replicating the finding in a very large number of emergency departments. This is another study, this is done with a justice network that shows that uh, it was a randomized clinical study, it was a pilot study that compared the benefits of extended release buprenorphine versus sublingual buprenorphine. Sublingual buprenorphine, when given basically even starting one month before release, significantly improved outcomes. But actually extended um, release buprenorphine, also when given one month before release, had even better effects, and you can see it Whichever of the indicators that you look, actually, it decreases the use of uh, uh, opioids as assessed by urine sample, it decreases retention in treatment, it basically decreases reincarceration. So this is, again, a very simple intervention, extended release buprenorphine. You give an injection once a month before the person is to leave jail, and that increases their likelihood that they are retaining treatment, and it basically protects them against relapsing into opioid taking, and certainly that then protects them from overdoses. This is uh, another study that just uh, to show the, this is not for extended release buprenorphine, just for 
buprenorphine compa comparing to gel systems. One of them uh, here that received buprenorphine while on gel versus the red one did not. And you also see that there was a significantly higher rate of recidivism and reincarceration in individuals that had not received buprenorphine. So not only does it decrease drug consumption, it actually uh, decreases the likelihood that they will end back in prison or jail. Um, the other aspect of the science that we've learned is during the COVID emergency, there were changes in the practices for administration of both methadone and buprenorphine. It became um, much easier to prescribe buprenorphine, that what we call low threshold buprenorphine. Buprenorphine could be prescribed through um, a, a, a basically a telehealth consult, or it could be uh, provided also through a call, and, um, and it could be provided by a physician that was from a different state. That was one, making, it, uh, making buprenorphine accessible to individuals that in the past did not have access to it. And with methadone, they allow for take home uh, methadone up to four weeks. And there was, when this was implemented, it was done because there was uh, otherwise people that were requiring these medications would not be able to get access to them. But what we've learned since then is yes, it significantly improved outcomes. It allowed for people to receive treatment. But we've also been monitoring whether it resulted, for example, in increased diversion of methadone or buprenorphine. And therefore, there was that concern that this will lead to overdoses. We now have the data, and the data does not show at all that there was an increase in overdoses. If anything, the number of overdose deaths from methadone, the relative percentage decreased, as is the relative percentage of overdose deaths from buprenorphine. So these practices have not resulted in negative effects. And on the other hand, they have provided the feasibility for patients to be able to receive treatment. And a study that was just published from uh, Canada that compares the outcomes on people that just have to go on a methadone on a daily basis, which can be extremely difficult for many individuals, versus those that take five or six doses take home methadone, that all of the outcomes are much better on individuals that are allowed to take methadone home. And this was whether it was increased during the COVID or no changes. So it's not that, it, because the one that says what no changes, Individuals that are allowed to take methadone home before the COVID pandemic were more stable. With a COVID pandemic that allow individuals who were not, they didn't have all of the qualifications that they needed in the past to take them. And that did not in any way negatively impact their outcome. In fact, it significantly improved them. So what we're now trying to do is how to make these changes permanent so that methadone can be delivered over longer periods of time so that methadone can be prescribed by physicians, clinicians, just like it's done for buprenorphine. And similarly for buprenorphine, to ease the requirements such that patients can have easier access to buprenorphine and to encourage new models of care for nurses to be able to oversee, for, for pharmacists to ever also be able to oversee the, um, the, the, the prescription of these, in, of these medications. Other very important changes during the COVID pandemic was the increased use of telemedicine as its reimbursement. And I'm sure that all of you have lived this because more and more medicine is now relying on telemedicine. Well, this has been very, very beneficial overall for patients with substance use disorder, and it has allowed and facilitated uh, the treatment of comorbid conditions. And similarly, it has brought in the justice settings where the use of telemedicine was very, very restricted that has changed with the COVID pandemic, providing jails and prisons the opportunity to provide treatments that in the, uh, in the past were not possible. So where are we now? We are now in a stage where the uh, illicit drug market has diversified as it relates to the over contributing to overdoses, that the overdoses are not just driven by opiates, but they are driven by combination of stimulant drugs. And more recently, they are also appearing for the first time ever among adolescents. So this is a slide that shows the data from 2015 to 2022 by each one of the four quarters of each year. And you can see that the overdose mortality in teenagers has been going down overall. And, and we have seen with monitoring the future, the lowest rates of heroin use ever since the inception of, 19, in the, of the survey in 1979. It's the lowest it's ever been. It's the lowest it's ever been for cocaine. It's the lowest it's ever been for many drugs. 
and yet look at this increases in overdose mortality from basically fentanyl. And this is a pattern that we had not seen. And you can see that the increase actually rose in 2019, just before the pandemic, and then it continues to go up. So the question is, what is driving it? And why is, what is driving it is, again, the contamination of fentanyl of the various illicitly uh, available drugs. And this is for illicitly manufactured prescription drugs. From 2018, these are drug seizures of uh, illicitly manufactured pills that contain fentanyl. fentanyl. From 2018 to 2021, these from 290,000 to 9 million, that's a 54, 50 fold increase. So now we see that people are overdosing, yes, because they may be getting their hands on these prescription drugs. And yes, teenagers do misuse prescription drugs. They use them to study for exams. Uh, they use them because they cannot fall asleep. They use them sometimes in parties to get high. Um, and similarly, people, adults, also sometimes they misuse prescription drugs because they have pain, they are anxious, and their physicians do not prescribe these drugs, so they buy them in the illicit market. To the extent that they basically the illicit market is being flooded with these illicit pills with fentanyl, you can start to recognize why this increases the risk of overdoses. So how do we deal right now with this crisis? I mean, I think that what it is um, bringing us to light is, yes, uh, how important treatments are, making them available, which again is not automatic. We need to provide the resources and the training so that quality evidence-based interventions are given to patients and that patients can retain in treatment. But it also highlights how crucial it is to actually do prevention. And this is where I want to end my talk, because I think that one of the most important things that we need to uh, strive to do is to ensure the uh, engagement and the involvement of healthcare providers and not wait for the specialty providers, the psychiatrists or the addiction specialists, but the healthcare providers to partner in the screening and uh, interventions of substance use disorders when, I, when they are starting to emerge. And that's why actually one of the things that me and our colleagues have been discussing is why don't we take, uh, basically learn from the lessons of the diabetes field where the pre-diabetes concept was initiated in 2000 to actually do interventions to ensure that people actually are given the opportunity and chance of changing lifestyles that can prevent them from becoming diabetic and putting resources into it. So we are uh, promoting the concept of a pre-addiction where basically asking, um, just like for the pre-diabetes, um, promote the screening of individuals for the early detection of in adolescence the drug experimentation and in adults uh, drug exposures that could be risky and then develop the interventions that would actually lead them to changes in those behaviors. I mean certainly there's research that needs to be done because while we do have uh, screening and brief interventions for alcohol use disorder there's still a lot of work that is necessary to develop equivalent ones for other drug use disorders. And similarly, there needs to be more effort targeted towards the development of such interventions for um, adolescents. And with that, I want to just end by saying, by ending up with these slides that I think tells us the whole story. As we're speaking of addiction and one of the concepts that people say, oh, it's not a disease because it has so many important environmental factors. And the reality is correct, but that does basically environmental factors play roles almost in every, almost not in every, but in almost in every disease that we know of. So it's not antithetical. This shows that addiction is one of the most solitary diseases and that isolation drives the drug taking makes people vulnerable. And, and to the extent that we stigmatize and discriminate people, of course, that promotes the isolation. And yet we know from very, very simple studies that even in animals that are, don't have the complex social structures that we do, like rats, still, when they do not have access to, when they, they actually, let, let's call it, when they have a social alternative where they can actually choose between a drug and a social uh, stimulus, they choose to interact with a social stimulus. They don't take heroin. It's only when we deprive them of that social stimulus that they start to take heroin. And then, then that's what we do when we stigmatize and discriminate people with substance use disorders. 
So as we look uh, forward into some of the challenges that we have into the future, we need to recognize that uh, prevention, poor prevention, one of the most powerful tools that we have is the creation of minimal social support systems that can help the individual. And that is also going to be extraordinarily valuable for achieving recovery after treatment, that the social support system is crucial. And to the extent that as a society, we continue to stigmatize, then we're going to actually have a very powerful driver to increase the risk for people to trace that drug and to, the, to actually also increase the, the risk of really adverse outcomes, which is currently what we are observing, unfortunately, in the United States, where, as I said, basically it has reached the milestone of a million overdose deaths in the past two decades. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I do not know if there was any time planned for questions, but I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Dr. Nora Wolfs, thanks a lot for this very nice presentation. And uh, would like to open the question for two to maximum two, three question only. Any, please, this one. Uh, thank you uh, for this presentation. My question about the fentanyl overdose, what is the source of fentanyl drugs in the state? And uh, what is the intervention taken to minimize that problem? I didn't touch the first question. What is? What is the source of fentanyl? The source of fentanyl doses is it from the black market or from the or from the hospitals? And no, what is the main the intervention market. that you consider to minimize that problem? Yeah, no, the fentanyl that is currently in the illicit drug market is coming from. Uh, Outside the United States, mostly it is below, believed that it is being manufactured in Mexico and the precursors, some of them are believed to be coming from China. So what the government is doing is actually um, working with the uh, Chinese and the Mexican government to make the precursors um, more hard to come by and so minimize, uh, therefore, the synthesis of fentanyl. So that's one of the main strategies and, of course, trying to remove the supply, while at the same time from the uh, basically uh, doing interventions to educate people about the dangers of fentanyl and provide also harm reduction interventions, for example, like fentanyl test strips that will allow people that are using drugs to test the drug supply so that if it is contaminated, they are aware that this drug could actually result in an overdose. So there are multiple strategies that are currently being done. One of them is targeted towards decreasing the amount of fentanyl that gets into the United States. And the other one is prevention interventions and harm reduction, as well as treatment interventions, of course, and harm reduction uh, policies to um, protect people from dying. Thanks a lot, Prof. Second question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. This Can you please introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Professor Ahmed Jamal, uh, uh, consultant of uh, toxicology and phytochemistry from Sudan. Nash uh, uh, from the Ahfad University for Women. I would like to just uh, see whether the methamphetamine you have mentioned as a source of uh, overdose or this, uh, was prepared in the form of tablets like Yaba and other tablets or in the form that is injected, inhaled, or smoked. Thank you very yeah. much. Because this, that is which is called ice for us now. Ice or, or crystal mess uh, is, is creating a problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, and most of the methamphetamine that is currently in the United States is for uh, smoking or in pills. Some of it is injected, but the amount of injection met of methamphetamine is much lower than the administration by smoking or by oral route of administration. The last question, Dr. Selma. Yes. 
Thank you, Nora, very much for your oh my. Uh, presentation. My name is Dr. Salman Al Zayani. I'm Assistant Professor of Public Health in Bahrain. Uh, I agree with you, COVID 19 was very uh, dis disruptive, and uh, the number of deaths uh, last year in the United States is very disturbing. Um, I wonder if there was a change in policy of pres prescribing pain management medication to, to the point that we see a lot of that, that surge in numbers of, of deaths. As was, was there any change in policy, maybe due to telemedicine or whatever other reason during that, the pandemic? Thank you very much. No, thanks for the question. It's an important question because what happened in 2010, there were many guidelines actually and the recognition that there was an overprescribing of pain medication. So what happened was it was a patient's started to, to find that it was very difficult for them to be treated for their pain conditions. And patients for whom uh, opioids were the only solution, then were forced to look into il the illicit market in order to get some relief from their pain. In 2016, or uh, the CDC came up with guidelines on how to properly prescribe opioids and how to monitor opioid prescriptions. Uh, but the way that they were interpreted led many clinicians not to want to actually prescribe any more opioids. And that is a problem because people that have severe pain are desperate. And if there's nothing else that we can give them to treat their pain, they will rely on the illicit market to get opioids and to get some level of relief. And currently, and that is right now still the case, so if the illicit prescription out there so you can buy an oxycontin if it contains fentanyl uh, that risk of overdose are much greater but it so it does highlight the issue that we cannot neglect the proper treatment and management of patients with severe pain and that this is an a gap area where we, again as clinicians we are very limited in the resources that we have available and also where the reimbursement system has basically make it harder to develop and to uh, prescribe multi-pronged approaches. It's, it's cheaper in a way to prescribe an opioid than to provide a more comprehensive pain management. So that's something also that we need to evaluate and to develop models of care that will actually help people that are suffering from pain so that they don't go then looking for these illicit substances. Thank you, Prof. One more last question, which came from our fan here. Thank you. My name is Professor Michael Lezenwa from Nandazikwe University, Nigeria. I'm a clinical psychologist. Please, what is the success rate of uh, methadone therapy from your presentation? And ha have you considered in your research the combination of this with other non pharmaceutical methods, for example, motivation therapy or motivation intervene? to see whether that can improve the effectiveness of these new methods. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, and I'm glad you bring this up because certainly what, when I basically was highlighting how difficult it is to retain people on, on medications for opioid use disorder, uh, 50 to 40% relapse at six months, sometimes 60%, I was, so it depends on, on the support systems. What is it that we can intervene to do to actually retain them better in treatment? Uh, in the United States, um, w there have been studies comparing retention rates for methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And methadone is the medication for which we have the best retention rates in the United States. In terms of numbers, 300,000 people actually are being treated with methadone, and uh, it is a estimated that 1.5 million were given a buprenorphine prescription. Now, what, what percentage of those individuals have concomitant behavioral treatment? And that varies, and, and it varies depending on where you are being treated. There is in some instances evidence that the combination of behavioral treatment with buprenorphine improves outcome. But there's also evidence that for some patients, it does not actually result in increased benefits. So what is clear though, is that we need to basically do not have like a general recipe that everybody is going to require this or that, that we need to evaluate the characteristics of the patient and uh, uh, treat them uh, proper, uh, accordingly. 
We just published a paper actually that I think is very intriguing because it shows that individuals that were on buprenorphine at the same time that were receiving an antidepressant medication and actually had better outcomes and retention that those that had received an antidepressant before buprenorphine but were not continued to be treated with it. Which in my brain, the way that I interpret it is it's actually telling us that um, there's a high comorbidity with depression in individuals with opioid use disorder and that if you want to improve retention and outcomes, you need to actually address the, the depression. So uh, both the treatment of the depression and the opioid use disorder resulted in better outcomes. And one can say, see the same thing with the behavioral interventions, whether it is contingency management or motivation therapy, um, you tend to actually, uh, in many instances, improve outcomes. Thanks a lot, Prof, uh, for having your time with us today and sharing with us uh, your knowledge and experience, um, being with us in the ISAP conference and involving us with us in the National Rehabilitation Center. Just to remind you, I'm Dr. Hamid Al Ghafri. I'm who signed with you, the MOU. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being with us. Bye bye.